This crowd rises to its feet. Picaro slammed it home. Darwin left wing, three ball. Perfect. Darwin, part of the lane, locked. The Mobley, pow. And Allen blocked the shot at the rim. Pow with the left hand and a foul. Welcome to the Chase Town Podcast, part of the Cavs Media Family. I'm your host, Justin Rowan. The Chase Town is presented by Fubo, the official streaming partner of the Cavs. Watch over 350 channels of live sports and TV, including Valley Sports Ohio, without cable. There's no cost and no commitment. Try for free at FuboTV.com slash Cavs. The Cleveland Cavaliers, all things considered, had a pretty successful weekend. They went one and one with a win over the Sixers, a blowout loss to the Denver Nuggets. And with those results, they moved back into third place in the Eastern Conference. But the seedings race could not be tighter. Joining me today is my co-host, Carter Rodriguez. Carter, how are you doing, buddy? I'm doing good. Uh, I had a uh, surprising company holiday uh, today. I didn't know. I didn't know we were getting uh, the the Monday after Easter off. Um, so uh, made the most of it. Uh, my parents came over, uh, took the baby, had a little uh, Daddy and Millie day. Went to Kosai, which is our little uh, children's museum in Columbus. That's lovely. Um, and then we closed the closed the night out watching uh, the Elite Eight game between Iowa and LSU. Uh, and Super fun. Uh, Millie's amazing uh, half of basketball. Yeah, amazing half of basketball. Uh, Millie's killer comedy bit was to call her Angel Reese Cup. She thought that was <laughs> the height of comedy, but she was also very impressed, especially when she got that steal uh, in transition layup. So super fun to just to, to watch women's basketball with my daughter. I gotta say, puts me in a really really good mood. You know, she's still too little to really know what's going on, but like. You know, having her go, that's Caitlin Clark, right? And me getting to confirm it is like really, really cool. It's really cool the state of the game uh, women's basketball is in. Uh, I would kill to get Columbus or Cleveland to WNBA team, my friend. Mm, that, that would be really, really cool. Um, it, as I said, awesome half of basketball. It was cool to, to check that out. It's been, uh, even though I work today, I kind of had this afternoon uh, of basketball because I rewatched the Nuggets game. Uh, prior to the uh, the LSU Iowa game, and I gotta tell you, Carter, a lot of the times, like the, one of the main reasons I do a rewatch is I don't, I'm not as gifted as friends of the podcast like Steve Jones or uh, you know the people that can do those breakdowns live. I need to go back, I need to rewatch, I need to find out what happened. Uh, I get too emotional watching the games live, and I can't remember a bigger gap in how I felt emotionally about a game versus the rewatch than I have with this Denver one because oh, I watching I was miserable after the the second half uh, of that Nuggets loss and rewatching it I I think like my perception of how the Cavs competed in, in the first half was dramatically different than reality. Because when I went back and watched it, I'm like, man, you know, the defense is locked in. The Cavs are attacking the paint. Darius, I was incredibly frustrated overall uh, with kind of the lack of production. And re-watching it, I noticed that a lot of that came in the second half. I, I thought actually in the first half, even though they were running him off the three-point line, he was taking some pull-up mid-range jumpers, which I wanted to see. He was attacking the basket, got guys involved. Didn't love the turnovers, but I, I thought it was a better half. And, you know, it. I almost forgot that the Cavs were actually leading by four points with five minutes to go in the second quarter. And yeah, my dumb know, ass was like, they're really making it ugly for Denver in this one <laughs> right yeah, around like there. It, it felt good. And, and then Jokic checked back in. And then from that point on, I would say Denver just kind of thoroughly outclassed them. And I, I would say also, they were playing some murder ball. They were, yeah. it was ugly. Yeah, and obviously, you know, credit go, goes to Jokic. Um, we've been on this kind of the opposite end of those type of games in the past, uh, back when, when LeBron was on the team. Uh, but that was a clinic. That, that was a Denver team that has been, you know, coming off back-to-back home losses for the first time all season. They're in a big-time standings race. And Jokic came out, and he was just dominant. And I thought, you know, once the, the wheels started to come off, everything broke apart, right? Like, I, I thought the Cavs were overreacting to what Jokic was doing offensively. I thought, um, you know, the, the defensive continuity was breaking down and just everything snowballed from there. But I thought the Cavs actually came out with the right effort, with the right game plan for this game, and then just got beat by a better team. Well, you you got to know a couple things. Thing one, um, Denver had a couple bad losses in a row. I think they were coming off their first consecutive home losses all year. 
Mm -hmm. Um, so they, I, I had a feeling they were going to come out with something to prove. Um, and you know, we're going to come out focused. They weren't going to, you know, sleepwalk through this one. Also, given the fact that the Cavs embarrassed them on the Cavs home floor, uh, at the beginning of the year where, you know, Jokic gets tossed and, uh, or fouls out, I think like in the third quarter or, or, you know, and it's just a total beating from pretty much start to finish in that game that, you know, Jokic plays probably his worst game of the season. Uh, in that one so you know he had something to prove uh so like you that is a factor um the fact that they shot the absolute cover off the ball is a factor uh mm-hmm. the nuggets finished the game uh, eight of 15 from three and that significantly lowered their three-point percentage on the evening as they started <laughs> 13 of 18 from three yeah. uh so uh you know like you look the funny at- thing is they shot worse as the defense got worse, right? Like there, there was, um, you yeah. know, the, the Reggie Jackson contested shot. Like there was a bunch of kind of contested shots in the first couple MPJ half. drifters, including yeah, the one he and, and hit those- that he got called for an offensive foul on the kick on. I was like, oh my God, this is not going to be our night if he's hitting that one, even if we got right. the points back. And then we're throwing, you know, doubles at Jokic and just like the defensive continuity kind of completely broke down at that point. And then they're not hitting as many shots. So, you know, it it was kind of one of those nights I saw, you know, a friend of the podcast, Matt Moore, um, also mentioned that, you know, this is kind of the the thing I've seen before where teams just look gassed with the altitude in in the second half, particularly if they're, they're, you know, playing through some stuff and whatnot. But at the end of the day, like no matter how much context, no matter how much you want to slap on it, we are in a, a big time standings race when it comes to this Eastern Conference. The Knicks are a half game back. They have the tiebreaker. Orlando uh, likely will be a game and a half back a- after tonight. Uh, I'm assuming they were going to beat the Portland Trailblazers. They're up 12 with four minutes left in the third. Uh, that would be what you would expect. Um, <laughs> Port- Portland is shorthanded and not great uh, when, when they are fully rostered. So um, can I can I do are... a can I do a, a brief aside that's not going to help the pot at all about the Blazers? Sure. Yeah. Ha- Haberstro so does stat- that momentum, buddy. Ha- Haberstro does stats for them uh, on their mm-hmm. broadcast. He tweeted something about how the Blazers have had like you know nine games. I'm BSing the number. They've had nine games where four rookies scored in double digits. No other team has won. And I'm like, well, that's because most teams aren't rostering four rookies, brother. Yeah. <laughs> that, that made me laugh out loud when I saw that that stat. I was like, you know, he's just doing his job, but it made me laugh. I, I mean, we were certainly there in some oh, of those we sure were. Years where, where you're just looking for any looking for anything a, fun. A, any little fun, little factoid or whatnot. Um, but you know, after the game, obviously Donovan Mitchell had comments about how, you know, this is April. We, we need to take this serious. All these games matter. Um, he talked about how, you know, people from the outside may point to the injuries and stuff like that. We can't do that. We like, we are who we are and and we need to kind of turn this thing around. And, you know, I, I personally loved it. Um, one of the things I, I think we have learned through Donovan's time in Cleveland is that man accountability is his middle name like he's not afraid to to you know um talk about where he's come up short where the teams come up short and whatnot and i wasn't surprised to see you know first on the list was himself saying i gotta play better and whatnot and you know watching these last two games i think it's clear that he's not at 100 uh that, that he is still playing through something the burst isn't necessarily there but i gotta say even doing the, the rewatch of the denver game i'm feeling just a tad bit more optimistic about that because I thought he got more tired as the game went on. And that's understandable given the the time off and whatnot. Like I thought the kind of burst got progressively worse. There were times he actually did get to the basket and, and, you know, even though he is in a limited state and, and let's be honest, like, at this point, there's no real sign that he's going to be at 100% uh, at, at any point for the, the remainder of the season. I think, you know, if he can get back to being a little more confident, feel a little more comfortable getting back in shape, I, I still think that he can make a, a significant impact on this team. Uh, yeah, I mean, I hope so. Um, you know, again, it's kind of, I won't lie. Part of me feels like we're kind of grading on the, uh, on kind of the curve we've been grading Garland on, you know, where it's like, Hey, he got to the basket a few times. Like that's Donovan Mitchell gets to the basket a lot, you know, like the, and so, you know, you're just kind of looking for an obvious parallel there, man. Like, I I think like 
both of them, it seems like they don't want to get hit in the face right now. Whether yeah, also, it's hilarious that we're both wearing black shirts while we're talking about this. But uh, I, I, I was going to make a comment on that earlier. We we really didn't. <laughs> a we funereal didn't vibe. Today. Uh, but uh, but no, uh, you know, I thought, you know, I, I thought he his game was certainly, you know, I thought he made some really nice passes um, in this game. And, you know, I do think that's where you know if you're not going to be at 100 percent going into the postseason like that's where you're glad that he has developed so much as a playmaker over these last two years where it's like he can still make that you know that crazy pass to Struess, uh under the basket at the beginning of the game and again i really do think i think part of the reason i wasn't as grumpy as perhaps other uh, compatriots on twitter were um I, about this particular game was like i did think they played a really good first half against a really really tough team who was playing well in kind mm-hmm. like i don't think it was like a denver's just messing up but once they focus on focus up this is over like i think they played i think they were playing great the whole way through um the Cavs just you know we're 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 out executing them and and scheming up correctly and you know Jokic just went superhero mode and the Cavs were not resilient uh must be said but you know I'll, I'll, most teams get well you know when they're down nine going into the third quarter and a team goes on a quick 10-0 run where they're just hitting really tough shots and you're generating and the Cavs generated a couple clean looks at the beginning of that quarter and yeah. they weren't falling and you know on a night where you only hit eight threes that you know you, you feel that in a 29 point loss and uh, they certainly let go of the rope. There's no way uh, I think the Cavs would tell you that as well. Um, oh, yeah. And, like, I think, like, Donovan being as frustrated as he was after that game kind of does speak to the fact that, like, we can contextualize all we want. We can, we can, you know, we can bring all all the all the information. We can talk about, you know, like the stuff we did right at the beginning. You know, Denver had lost two in a row at home, blah, 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 blah. It still sucks to lose by 29. It sucks to be well under 500 post All-Star break when you were, you know, it, it stinks to be a team that was on pace to win 56 games uh with their record at the end of the all- going into the All-Star break and it being relatively unlikely that they'll get to they'll get past 50 if they get to 50 at all. Yeah. Um yeah, that all stinks. I don't want to like I I'm trying not to like uh, you know, uh scold or or, or push back against oh, feeling yeah. frustrated because like I certainly feel frustrated and I think Donovan feels frustrated like and like I don't see how he couldn't especially like if you're in that locker room like the hits have just kept coming and he's not at a hundred percent the team is not playing their best ball at all um and like h- how could you not just feel a little beat up at this point um and you know, well, and- I'm, I'm sure him not being at 100% is a big part of the frustration too, right? Like yeah. losing your physical abilities and especially at such an important time of the year, not being at 100% and trying to work your way back. Like it's the most frustrating time to be doing that. I mean, uh, I, I know how I feel in terms of losing my ability to like function as a normal human, you know, physically. And um, Donovan... I, I don't have the pressure uh, of a playoff push. I don't have the pressure of, you know, a uh, uh, franchise season riding on my shoulders as, as it does with him. I, and like the unfortunate thing, like I'm not trying to tell anyone that this doesn't suck. I think you were correct to kind of point that out because, you know, it, it's disappointing. Like it, it's changed looking at how they look right now. It's changed my expectations for the playoffs. Like I, I still think the goal should be winning around. And, and I think that they're capable of doing that, but the team they've been right now isn't the team that's going to win around, right? I, I, I think there's enough reasons to, to believe, hey, this can turn around over the next three weeks prior to the playoff starting, but like it it does get, you know, a little hairy. It gets concerning. And um, I think, you know, Donovan, it, when he speaks like that, it's to fire everyone else up, right? Like it's to, to understand the importance of this moment. It's just a because... vent, you know? It's, it's, it's natural to <laughs> vent a little bit. Like we've, we've had plenty of vent sessions off to the side over the course of this year where things just are not bouncing their the team's way despite you know having a team again that i do think is better built uh than it was last year it's better constructed than last year um and and yet this is why you know you can't just hit sim season uh like you can in 2k and just let the let the simulation run like you have to play the games players get hurt players just play below their 
their their skill level whether they're hurt or not um you know players uh, have things going on in their personal lives you know who, who all all this you know kind of just adds up and to 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 a final product and sometimes guys exceed their kind of their their expectations sometimes they go way below it and you know there's just been some of that like they feel like a little less than the sum of their parts right now um they which are. is disappointing they are. like that's 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 the the biggest thing and and, and it sucks because individually I, I don't think there's a lot of guys kind of playing up to the standard you'd expect um i, I think right now evan mobley is the only one that i would point to saying hey th- he's playing great like I, yeah. I think he's been really really good since he's been back Jared, you can definitely tell that that he's worn down and he's tired. The the defense uh, just isn't at the the same high level. Like he's still obviously a net positive there, but it's not the same level. And you can tell, like even Donovan coming back uh, playing with Jared again. Like there there's times where he's throwing a pass, expecting, hey, this is January, Jared. He's going to go up and get that, and he's like, yeah, I, like I don't have that right. Like, what he's was that? Down was it against to... Philly where they did that crazy high low pass and he just biffed the what should have been a dunk? Yeah, like, I, I think at the think underside of the rim. You know, it's just like. Things just Doesn't aren't have the same pop. Yeah, and, aren't and quite like, clicking. And for Donovan's case, uh, I think like the stat that captures it, I, I heard on Chris Fedor's pod. So shout out to him. Go check that out. Um, but he talked about since the All Star break, Donovan is four of twelve from inside the three point arc. Only twelve shots, and six of those twelve shots have been blocked. Like that usually doesn't happen. He typically generates so much separation. He typically generates so much more rim pressure. And you know, like if the version of him that we currently have is one that's going to float around on the perimeter a little bit more. You would hope that that Darius would be at a point where he's attacking the basket like he does when he's fully healthy, and you don't have Our that boys either. are getting their shots packed at the rim right now. There's just no way around it. Yeah, and, you know, it's frustrating. It's disappointing. I think, you know, from Darius' standpoint, what I'd really like to see is just, you know, him coming off those dribble handoffs or, you know, coming off of the nail and just pulling up and taking that mid-ranger. Like, just like we talk about how Evan has to take some of those open shots to open up other opportunities. I think right now teams are expecting Darius to to either drive it to the rim or throw that dump off pass. And like a lot of the times the read to Allen on the roll is kind of the right read, but defense is ready for it. They're, they're kind of like ready to, to help out at the rim and force it into a floater. And they'll kind of live with that as an option. I'd like to see more of those mid range pull-ups from him, especially when teams are running him off the line, like Denver did. And, you know, take those shots to open up the rim, to open up other opportunities and just change up and show some variety in terms of what you're doing offensively. Here, here's a take that I'm I'm kind of settling into as as you're saying that. I just wonder if if this is going to be kind of roughly what the guards are, what Darius and Donovan are going to be heading into the postseason. Part of me just wonders if they need to say, screw it. We're gonna get. We're gonna take a lot more threes, and we're not gonna be guys who live at the rim. So, and we don't have our normal burst at the rim. So we need to chuck a little bit more with our pull up game, with our with our catch and shoot game, to try to lure the defense into overreacting out mm-hmm. uh, out of the paint. You know, I I always think about you know I always remember in those old you know the Warriors Cavs wars where stat nerds would try to argue that Steph Curry was a better finisher than Kyrie because his rim percentage was higher, which obviously was infuriating because like most of Steph's layups were wide open because they were a result of guys flying at, (laughs) at him and or or, or backdoor cuts. Yeah. Or backdoor cuts or whatever it may be. Like if you're not, if, if finishing mid to high tier degree of difficulty layups is going to be harder for these guys to do, Part of me wonders if they just need to lean into a higher variance offense that, you know, with a little bit more of a quick trigger on the jumper, whether from three or from mid range. So Mm -hmm. you can, and and if if you're not hitting those, well, you know, it's probably good night no matter what, but if you are hitting them, then you do see a a more open lane with more consistent avenues to, to, to easy layups. 
your thoughts. Yeah, I, I agree with that. Like, I, I think, you know, more threes is definitely something that I want to see. Um, I do think, you know, smarter teams like Denver are going to be able to run them off the line a little bit. And I think there, there was a, a fair bit of that. Like, it wasn't just Darius that wasn't able to get up threes. It was, you know, Max couldn't get threes going. Uh, Donovan, obviously, you know, heavy grains of salt added to anything we saw there because he, he's working his way back from injury. But um, I, I do think, you know, if... If your thesis is I want more jumpers in general, I, I want to see kind of those mid-range pull-ups and whatnot, I'm I'm on board. Like I, I want to see, you know, as much as I hate to give him credit, I, I want to see a, a little more Jalen Brunson out of Darius where, you know, he, he's pulling up from mid-range because he un understands hey, if the defense isn't in rotation, it's going to be harder for me to finish at the rim, right? So, and that's especially true with this version that we've seen here. So if that's what gets things going and, and you know, from there, it opens up other opportunities, whether it be, you know, the, the high-low passing, finding Allen or, or Mobley in the dunker spot, the big the big actions they have and whatnot. Um, I think that would be very helpful. Yeah, so it, I just, I don't know. I'm just trying to think about what strategies, you know, are going to bear fruit, you know, in the end. And, like, yeah, you right now the team is not built to be a high-rim pressure team Yeah, uh, outside of the two bigs. I think that puts an impetus on Jared and Evan to pick up a ton of pain points, which luckily I think they're capable of doing. I think it puts an impetus on them to play with force. I think it puts an impetus on them to be great screeners off the ball and great sealers when those guys do get past their man. You know, that's one thing I don't think the Cavs do particularly well compared to some of these other teams with some burlier bigs, just the kind of the Gortat screen where you're just yeah. kind of screening your own help defender uh, to to give Darius or uh, or DG or or, uh, or Donovan, sorry, I just said Darius or Darius, uh, Darius <laughs> or Donovan, a clearer path or cleaner angle. That's something we don't do a great job at because that's kind of it's kind of like boxing out your own man a lot of the time, and you know yeah. we're just not that's not our big hyper strength. But like I just go back to thinking like, okay, if we're not going to be a great rim pressure team at base right now because of uh, you know, whether it's health concerns or just current, you know, uh, standard of play concerns, then you just got to find other creative angles because they're running out of time just to wait for that stuff to get better. So, yeah. like, I that's the kind of thing that I, I want to see. I want to see them get really creative with their off-ball actions, getting into their offense faster so they can generate those looks without having just to drive to the hoop because that's that's hard for them to do right now. Yeah, I, I totally agree. And I, I think I want to get into the pace a little bit later because that's been one thing that's really dropped off since the All-Star break. And, and I think a lot of that has come down to fourth quarters for the Cavs. Um, I, I think prior to the Denver game, uh, their pace in the fourth quarter was actually 84, which is just insanely low um, since the All-Star break. Like, that's just unacceptable walk it up um the the one thing i'll, I'll mention too when it, when it comes to denver is yeah the defensive integrity did break down and i, I thought they got into kind of scramble mode uh, honestly it was a little reminiscent of overreacting to jalen brunson in the playoffs um but also you're going to have some defensive breakdowns when your two best perimeter defenders are not active in the lineup and obviously isaac okoro was not in that game uh dean wade was not active in that game and you know, it just puts you in a spot where you're relying on the two guards to who are working their way back. You're relying on Max Juice to do a lot against a, a tall Michael Porter Jr. And, you know, obviously Sam Merrill or Marcus Morris, they're, they're going to do their part and they're going to stay in position. But that's a that's a tall, tall ass. No, you're not going to get game changing defensive plays out of those guys like you would out of an Isaac Okoro or a Dean Wade. For sure. And another thing I wanted to note that we haven't really discussed with Donovan looking a little limited from an explosion standpoint is it really hurts him on the defensive end. Yes. Those on fire closeouts where he can stay low uh, at full speed and chop his feet and not get blown by. That's a lot harder for him to do when you're trying to rev up to full speed. Um, and all of a sudden that does make the small backcourt defensive kind of woes look a little bit scarier, especially since Darius, I think, is having his worst defensive season in the last couple of years. Um, so, yeah. so like, I just think that combination all of a sudden looks a little bit rougher, and, you know, you really notice when an Isaac and a Dean aren't there. Um, 
uh, to 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 be that pace changer to provide you know when one of, to stagger it so when one of them sitting you have an elite uh, defensive uh, option on the floor uh, most of the time you know so I, I I think that's another little note you know obviously uh, Chris Vito report, reported that Dean is still you know he might now even be back before the playoffs if he's ready for the playoffs at all and like. You know, again, Marcus just Morris kinda, just became a whole lot more important. Sure, sure did. You know, really glad they signed him for the season. Um, and, uh, you know, again, this is just one of those things with this season where, you know, Ty Jerome gets an ankle sprain, normally a month or so injury, and he's gone for the whole year. Um, yeah. uh, Dean Wade goes on personal leave for a couple days, comes back and may, may not be seen again. You know, it's just one of those seasons where the hits just kind of have kept coming both at the star level and at the role player level. Um, yeah, that, that's and the that's, thing. Like, that's tough. If you're assuming, like, you know, Darius and Donovan miss time, right? Like, in general, you can probably expect them to miss 10, 15 games a year. This year has obviously been worse uh, for both of them with, with freak issues that came up. But, like, if you go in knowing that, and, okay, Jared might get tired or, or is going to need some time off, um, you would say, okay, we want to invest heavily in, you know, backup guard positions. You have Ricky Rubio and you have Ty Jerome. Neither of those options become available. Okay, well, we, we've got Dean Wade. We've got George Niang. We're, we're investing in the backup four spot. We have Tristan Thompson coming in as a, an option off the bench, and he gets suspended, right? Like, every single, like, the, the type of insulating moves you would do from a, a support standpoint were all put in place. And just once again, you, you kind of have like the, those multi-level breakdowns. And yeah, no, and, and I, by the, and for what it's worth, like I do think it's important to say, like if this te- team doesn't do what they, uh, what they hope to do in the postseason because Dean Wade wasn't healthy, that's not good. You know, like you no. can't, you can't like Dean Wade was like we weren't sure he was going to be a rotation player uh, to start right. the year. Now he certainly has earned it. He's when he's been on the floor, I think it's been by far the best year of his career. Um. But, like, you know, you can't be a Dean Wade away from being able to succeed or fail in your season. That means yeah, your margins totally. were probably too thin. But it doesn't help, bro. Like, no. you know, like, well, and that, by the that's way. What, uh, that's what hurts with all this is, like, you look at it. Max has had, you know, the, the best season of his career. Dean's had the best season of his career. Isaac's had the best season of his career. Jared's had the best season of his career. And, like, these guys are, are because all those guys in particular – uh, carried such a heavy load when Mobley and Garland were out. I think you're seeing like the fatigue effect, right? Like Max had to be shut down. Dean, uh, you know, it had not a, like a freak injury, but I forget where uh, I saw it, but sword. there is something to our role players going uh, super duper Nova and then needing to miss a month because Strew, because Strews had right. his miracle Dallas performance. Then all of a sudden he's gone for a month. Dean had his miracle Boston performance. He's gone for a month. So like, I guess the role players just got to stop uh, doing so well. We need it. the second someone hits three threes in a row, we got to send them to the bench. Well, you know, not everybody disappears after doing a very good job. Zoom has been there all the time for us, Carter. It's consistently delivering and consistently showing up. Support for this podcast and the following message comes from Zoom. Half a million businesses connect using Zoom, a single platform for phone, chat, workspaces, events, apps, and video. Zoom enables real-time collaboration for teams around the globe. Zoom, how the world connects. Carter, the Cavs connected well against the Philadelphia 76ers in the clutch. I actually thought it was uh, a throwback, one of their better kind of clutch performances. Uh, It was nice to see Darius kind of be the engine of that um, outside of a a tremendous uh, Tyrese Maxey defensive play to to force a turnover. um, I thought those closing minutes from him were very strong uh, in terms of getting other guys involved, had the bucket uh, himself and just keeping the ball moving and playing with tempo. And of course, the highlight of all of it was Evan Mobley backpedaling into a confident, what basically ended up being the game winning three. How much fun was that, man? Like we, we got to talk about that game because in, in a stretch where not a lot has gone well, that was things that we wanted to see all happening in a really important moment in a game that they absolutely had to go get. Yeah, I mean, it was, I won't lie. I I said, I think I said out loud, what? Oh, no, as, no, as he was, no, yeah. <laughs> as, as he stepped back into it, but it was so confident. JB, I think, said after the game that that is what they drew up. Um, 
and I you think, know, it, I think he was being a little sarcastic yeah, there. Yeah. Oh, if well, you I, watch I, the video. I, I only, I only saw, saw the tweet. Either way, um, uh, he, you know, Mobley, I think played a really, really strong game. It was really fun, you know. And I watched that game, kind of watching Darius and Evan, the two guys who have taken more crap from the fans than anyone this year. Um, being the engines to to win us the game down the stretch. I don't believe uh, Jarrett played much in the fourth quarter. Did he play at all? No, uh, because George was playing so fantastic that yeah, they George. just never really went back to the the two big. Yeah, George. You know, my goodness, was George good in this game? I thought it was best <laughs> game. I thought it m- might have been a better actual offensive game than his supernova game, where he just couldn't miss. I thought he was. He's playing. been great since the break. Yeah, honestly, he's like, been I'm... very good. I, I'm 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 all in on the G wagon train right now. Like, yeah. he, he has been one of our more dependable rule guys. Yeah. Um. But to 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 that fourth quarter, like I, every possession down the stretch was running through Darius and Evan, and for the most part, it was pretty successful. They were hitting on lobs. They were getting deep deep seals into finishes. Uh, you know, Bamba got Mo- Mobley once, but you know, uh, Mobley got Bamba more than more than he got got. Um. Yeah. Uh, you know, hit the two threes, got to the line. Uh, Darius, I thought, was running a really nice offense. It was very nice to see them closing, running offense, running, you know, running some pick and roll, um, not just not just isoing. And, you know, Donovan clearly, again, uh, really trying just to, uh, you know, labor through it. You know, Donovan was not actively putting himself into the play uh, no. in that fourth quarter. I think it was a little bit of a, Listen, guys, I'm out here. I'll I'll shoot it if I'm open, but like you gotta you gotta go take this for for me. I'm while I'm trying to you know ramp myself up. And I thought Darius and Evan, you know, met the moment there. Um, you know, yeah. Part of why you know D- Darius's performance in the Denver game is so disappointing, uh, because again, he just can't. He hasn't been able to change six. Much like the Cavs, Darius has not yeah. been able to change successes, but um. You know, against Philly, I thought he really helped win them the game. And I will say this: uh, right after I maligned his defense uh, this season, I thought he I thought he played the best defense he's played all season against Tyrese Maxey, who yeah. went seven of twenty six. Um, and in his and I saw in a minutes. clip with our uh, our buddy Spencer Davies uh, was talking to Darius after the game, and he said last two games in particular have been probably a, m- one of my worst defensive games. Like I was really slacking on that end and I wanted to make an impact. I actually thought his defense was solid enough against Denver. Um, you know, I, I thought it was the, the everything else part that just yeah, <laughs> didn't end up yeah, working like out. I, so, you know, if the defense is trending in the right direction, that's good because honestly, like that's probably the answer when it comes to the Cavs is they're just going to have to, you know, elevate, themselves on the defensive end of the floor and win some ugly muddy games right like that's that's probably what it's going to have to be because i don't think we're getting the our, our kind of two core cogs in, in the offense back to 100 percent health in time for the playoffs like I, I just i'm skeptical of that until i see it but the Cavs have more than enough to, to get it done on the defensive end but you know if the offense is going to be dealing with guys that are that are limited and you know they're not able to get to the rim like they used to maintaining a proper pace i think is one of the most important things and one of the things that that i found you know doing research prior to the philly game even was just how slow the pace was in the fourth quarter and i the pace since the all-star break in the clutch has been 86.3 and that's including the philly game the philly game they got up to 100.13 much, much better, dramatically better. That's nice middle of the pack. And, you know, it, it's funny because pre-break, they were actually at 101.75, which is middle of the pack, right smack dab in the middle. Um, which is all I a- need them to be. I don't need them to be one. I just need them to not be playing at a snail's pace. Right. So as a point of reference to league leading pace in clutch situations is 106. So, you know, you're not too, too far off when, when it comes to total pace, but that's that's what we've seen a lot of, right? Like they would get into their sets uh, 16 seconds, that's 18 seconds on the shot clock, and we're able to get to a second and third action. And since the All-Star break, that just hasn't been the case. And, you know, it's been something we, we've seen with Darius, and maybe this is one of those examples of when things aren't right, falling back into bad habits. 
because when you look at the pace in the clutch with Darius on the court prior to the All-Star break, it was 107.26. That would be the quickest in the league by a very wide margin. Since the All-Star break, 84.58. Massive gap. Massive, massive gap. Same thing goes with Donovan. Um, Pre-break, 101.62. And then obviously, you know, the, the few games he's played Post All Star break, it would be the same at ninety point seven seven. But like Darius was playing in those clutch situations quicker than Donovan was in those solo point guard minutes, even right. Like and playing in more of those situations. That's what the Cavs need to do because if you're dealing with some limitations on the offensive end of the court, you cannot be allow letting the defense off the hook where they only have to defend one or two actions without a whole lot of movement. You you got to keep grinding and getting to those second and third defensive rotations where if you don't get a defensive breakdown and like they they're, they don't give up an open shot, at the very least, you might get them out of rebounding position. You might be able to generate those second chance opportunities because and, the defense is in scramble mode. And might I say, you don't need to be healthy to get into your offense early. You no, know, you, you do don't, not. you don't need to be playing well to get into your offense early. And like, this is, I think, the root of why, you know, this was a big root of my frustration after that the Hornets loss when we were, you know, I think pretty tough on the team was that like, listen, like I get it. If you're not shooting the ball well, if you're not explosive, as explosive as you're used to being, and, and that is frustrating and that is hard, I really don't think I'm going to often hold that against anyone, mm-hmm. you know, but when you aren't doing the stuff that you need to do to up your percentage chance of success that is just good smart basketball like that is when i think we'll we're likely to be critical and likely to get frustrated so like yep. an 85 uh, po- uh pace uh to close games post all-star break no matter how well you, what form you're in you are cutting yourself off at the knees and when you're not in good form and you're doing that you just you don't have a chance and and yeah. that is and that's very disappointing yeah and i think the main intention of bringing this kind of stuff up is saying hey like even though you're dealing with some limitations these are things you can do and you have and they're done, listening you they, they, they're yeah, listening it, to us they are right like it's it well you know the, the other side of it is for fans that are feeling down, hey, we're, we're not going to be at 100% health going into the playoffs. It's here's things that they have done at times that are yielding good results even in this state. This is stuff they can lean on to go get those results because, it, it, you know, I still firmly believe that this team can win around in the playoffs. It's probably going to be ugly. It's not going to feel as good as it did. I think the ceiling of this season is lower uh, because of everything that we've dealt with. I don't feel great about, you know, our ability to really push a team and challenge in the second round of the playoffs. But, you know, if they can get through this, if they can, you know, lean into better habits on both ends of the, the court to make up for the fact that they're missing some talent, just like they did earlier in the season when they were physically missing guys, you can do the same thing when you are missing aspects of your game and just kind of really lean on what's the most efficient path for us on both ends of the court. Yeah. Uh, you know, absolutely. Um, and that is what I really, that's the kind of stuff I'm looking to see. Like, you know, it, we, we often have kind of been ending these podcasts talking about like, what are we looking for? You know, in the upcoming stretch, what are we looking for before the end of the season to make us feel good? I'm not going to get pro. I'm well, you know, knock on wood, but I'm I'm probably not going to get Donovan looks like he's 100 percent all of a sudden or Darius is going to has put up five straight 30 and 10 games like that just feels kind of far away right now. What I want to see them do is control what they can control. I want to mm-hmm. see them lock teams the hell down on defense the way I know they're capable of. I want to see them run offense, early offense. I want them to compensate for their for the weaknesses they have in their game right now by leaning on other strengths. You know, hi, Evan, who, when the team's done well, kind of feels like he's a really important part of their offense uh, over the last couple weeks. Um, you know, and, and, not, and not leaning into these bad habits and... Um, you know, cutting off your nose to spite your face when you're already 
running, you know, at a deficit and not in in perfect form. That's what I want to see. I want to just see them get back to playing Cavs basketball, even if the results are 30% worse than what I'm used to seeing. Mm -hmm. I I can handle that. I just can't handle, you know, the demoralizers. Yeah, no, I, I, I totally agree. And, you know, when it comes to Evan too, like, this is one of the benefits of the way that the Cavs are built. Like, they are... You know, you, you look at the last couple of years and they've been a top heavy team. I think this year they've done a good job making up for that with some depth. But the nice thing about having, you know, a core four is when two of the guys are, are struggling to pull their normal weight, you have the ability to have other guys step up and, you know, really kind of be the, the champion of that time. And for me, like, this is an opportunity for Evan Mobley to continue to step up. Like the way that he's playing um the the fact that he's hit six of ten three since he came back um i don't know if i i shared my golf analogy before but uh you know i talked about how mobley after some time off it's just he's not thinking about it he's just swinging free and easy like i do after a winter uh, of no golf um but you know like he's just stroking that shot out there and, and it it looks great um i love the way that he's attacking and putting his body into guys um you know there were some grown man moves against denver in a really office uh, efficient offensive game so if mobley is being featured a little bit more and that's giving jared a bit of a break and allowing you know darius and donovan to be more jump shooters than uh their their more normal kind of well-rounded attack Maybe that's something that, you know, we just have to ride right now and that that can help everybody else kind of rediscover a rhythm and and buy them some time to get right. Because, you know, uh, from Donovan's standpoint, like some of it's, hey, the the knee, he's playing through whatever soreness he still has with that knee and whatnot. The other half is regaining confidence, taking contact, whether that be, you know, the knee itself or or the face. Some of that is learning to trust that leg again and and explode off it the same way. Like he might have that burst there, but he's just not confident to to load up in the same way that he has in the past because there's those mental hurdles that you have to overcome. Look Look at how Darius has been battling that kind of stuff, right? Like this is this is something that may take time and may not be as bad as it looks just because he's trying to overcome those aspects of whether you want to call it confidence or or just, you know, regaining the trust in his body. Yeah. Um, You know, in general, I just think there's a lot of that, a lot of beat up. Maybe they just need that reset. You know, the one thing you kind of hope, you know, there's no guarantee, um, but you hope that, uh, this the huge gap between the last game of the season and the start of the playoffs, six days. It's like a little baby all star break, you know. Yeah. Um, it's not an all star break, but it's close, you know. Especially if by some miracle their seating situation is resolved going into that, you know, the, that last game of the season, or maybe you can even, you know, play play the bench guys that last game, just give everyone some time to reset their body, reset their brain. Um, yeah. Uh, heading into so, the postseason. So to get this, just to make sure I'm understanding your point, you were trying to comfort me by saying it's like an all-star break after everything we have seen. <laughs> yeah, fair, fair, fair. Uh, it's not like that at all. And actually, it's not like that at all anyway, because they're going to have to practice a bunch. But, uh, you know, like I just think like not having to play game action, getting to have a couple days of just film review or guys getting just to sit and watch and and let their bodies heal a little bit like any little edge they can get right now i feel like is going to be important um and you know to me man it just feels like the rest of this regular season is survival time you know luckily new york has had a pretty hellish schedule yeah you know and and the Cavs have been kind of swapping third and fourth with them you know but you know they, their two game losing streak, their their uh, feels a lot better than our our one game losing streak. You know, going yeah. going to war with the Thunder uh, last night uh, while while we're getting blown out by twenty nine. So like, it it just feels like a survival thing. I don't know if the Cavs are going to be able to hold on to three. You know, if you were to ask me to make a call right now and bet my life on it, I'd probably say we land in the fourth spot and are yeah have a date with the Orlando Magic um that that's my sense too and and when you talk about you know shifting expectation for the playoffs boston i i saw this the gap 
in terms of point of wrench differential for the Boston Celtics and second in net rating is larger than the 2017 Warriors and the next best team, which I believe was the case. Wow. Like that is probably your number one favorite to go out and win the championship. And, and maybe it's, maybe it's Denver. Um, yeah, I, you know, I, I'll as defending Denver. Champ- I will be picking Denver. Okay. I, I, I think if Boston doesn't win, that's, pretty rough given how good they are but i just you know, i don't believe in that i really don't i don't unless you have a gener like a generational talent leading your team um and they're i telling us they do i i i don't care what they're telling us i'm telling i care what my eyes see uh i want my eyes see is a you know a, a tier two tier two and a half tier two player uh in tatum who's awesome but he's not a top five guy in my opinion mm-hmm. he's close but he's not that yeah and uh and i just think i've been a lebron james fan for too long uh in a in a supporter of that guy's legacy uh to uh for too long to say that it's title or bust i think if you're top two in the league you had a great year and i just yeah i just, I just like to slander boston too, i know so you I'm do putting buddy. myself in position i know well, you while do we're here let's let's do a little bit of a show that we don't normally do who is closer to that superstar tier in your mind? Just looking back historically, Jason Tatum or Indiana Paul George? Um, that upper echelon kind of historic. I think count. it's Tatum. Tatum's been to so many conference finals already. Um, you know, he's played on some good teams, but he's played on some pretty mediocre teams too that have gotten there. You know, where you look at to a team that was in the conference finals the year before. Yeah, and and everyone died. <laughs> <laughs> that that next year so uh you know uh i i think tatum you know tatum tatum really really guards um oh, yeah. uh in a way he's that he's improved i think george kind of kinda stopped like. over time uh you know george got hurt uh and wasn't quite the same after he got hurt yeah i'm talking about apex versus apex i mean here. i i mean i i'm i was one of the biggest fans of apex indiana paul george i thought he was a I always thought when teams like would laugh at when people would laugh at the East and then we'd play the Pacers in the first round or whatever, I'd be like, Man, this is a heck of a first round date. <laughs> like this guy's <laughs> awesome. So, yeah. you know, I, I think I think Tatum gets gets the edge. Um but you know, he also is he has been lucky to be drafted by a franchise that really has believed in him and kept trying to retool and find creative ways like they really yeah. haven't just run it back. He's played with like nine different iterations of that team, all that have kind of be- suited him quite well. Um, yeah. So the, the fallacy uh, of going all in too, which I like to bring up, which you know Boston they took some gambles, right? Like they took some consolidation swings. They've they've and they found ways to you know g- create new assets and and find other ways to, to add talent there. And he's done a great job adding to his game. I think I think, I think Tatum is going to be a confusing guy we talk about at the end of his career. That's I think what I'll say. I, I think that's fair to me. It's Paul George, but I'm I'm massive Paul George guy, so I'll I'll give him a little bit of a nod. Um, I, I think if he was drafted into that Boston situation, um, things would would be a little bit scary for the league. But um, you know, getting it back to the Cavs, I do want to talk about what we have with this remaining trip. Four games left. Both of them are back to backs. Uh, tomorrow against Utah, no Larry Markkinen, um, John Collins, and Jordan Clarkson are questionable. That's a game you got to get. Like I, I think, plain and simple. I think. I think if we lose that game, you really start looking at the five seed. I, I think you know. I agree with that. I, I think the the Phoenix one is going to be tough. I, ideally, you want to get I think two and two here on, on this trip. Get one of the LA games. Um, Clippers aren't playing particularly well. Lakers are you know fighting for their their playoff lives that's going to be a tough one but it's not like it's the greatest team on the planet either you could go out and win if the Cavs were in top form and still the you know the best road team in the league i would say three and one is possible here um but given how tough the task is going to be in phoenix uh who is also fighting for their playoff lives it's going to be a three and four with travel and whatnot you got to get this utah one i think like that that is such an important game you could be looking at a winless road trip if, if you lose against Utah. And we beat a fully healthy Utah Jazz with Lowry, with Colin, with, with everyone rolling, without Garland, without Mitchell, and without Mobley. You got to lock up. You have to have that intensity. I think if the Cavs come out with the same... They've lost first nine half, in a row. 
if they come out with the same first half and are really nine in a row I, yeah. I was not aware that it was that I just bad checked. At, but i also follow Hiram, so i had no idea that uh <laughs> anything was going poorly there um but yeah so you got to win that one you absolutely have to go and win that one i think it starts on the defensive end that's what the Cavs are going to have to lean the, uh, or hang their hat on and you get that one try to steal it against phoenix um you know i i don't know if donovan's going to get rested for either of these back-to-backs or, or what the case is going to be obviously that that's something the coaching and medical staff will have to figure out but if you can steal one and get the three and one here i think you feel pretty good about your ability um to facing um memphis indiana and charlotte at home to close out the season Justin, you i just i just like to note uh the blazers have the ball with 12 seconds left down one uh so <laughs> we'll see if uh we'll see if oh anthony simons or scoot henderson simons probably isn't playing at this point see if no, scoot henderson's got a miracle for us baby yeah, and Simons wasn't even playing this game, I know, because uh, yeah, he, uh, I, I he hurt me in fantasy. I presume. Um, yeah, the, yeah, wow, that's uh, that's hard. That's hard to believe. I almost want to stall, do this podcast just a little bit longer. Do, <laughs> just, do you have any topics? Do you have any thoughts? Things you want to get off your chest? Yeah, or Delano or Banton. Uh, what a, what a what a what a fantasy performance to close the year for that for that <laughs> for, for the way back boy, Delano <laughs> Banton. <laughs> Oh boy. Well, our listeners will know the result of that game. That would be great if Portland could, could somehow to go out and, and steal that one. But the, the Cavs are going to have to take care of business themselves. Um, Orlando plays, you know, Milwaukee twice down the stretch and, and they got some tough matchups here. So I think if the Cavs can close out the, this year, either four and three or five and two, uh, you're laughing, you're feeling good about it. But the time is now, as Donovan said, it, it's April. Like you, you got to go out and win these games. It's so, April, comma, Chris. April. Absolutely. <laughs> uh, big thanks to everyone that tuned in live on YouTube. Uh, we really do appreciate you guys. Make sure you like and subscribe. Click the notification bell so you know when we're going live. If you're listening to the podcast and you want to support us, leave us a rating, leave a review, subscribe, unsubscribe, resubscribe, and help cook those books. If you want to be part of Chase Down's exclusive Discord chat, send a screenshot or view to chasedownpod at gmail.com. However, you choose to support us, we really do appreciate it. Make sure you guys are staying safe out there. Until next time, go Cavs.